good day and welcome to the 2021 Africa Dialogue Series, the flagship event of the United Nations Office of the Special Advisor on Africa. This year's theme is Cultural Identity and Ownership, Reshaping Mindsets, which is anchored in the African Union's theme for the year, Arts, Culture and Heritage, Levers for Building the Africa We Want. It's brought to you by, uh, it's brought to you in partnership with the United Nations Educational Scientific and Cultural Organization. My name is Modesta Maiga Buguni. I am a Pan-Africanist of Tanzanian origin and your moderator for what I believe will be a promising, rich and forward building conversation between iconic African filmmakers and historians that continue to shape narratives mindsets, and influence policy in their fields. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Tsitsi Dangarembwa, a Zimbabwean screenwriter, director, producer, novelist, and playwright, Dayo Ogunyemi, a Nigerian entrepreneur and investor in film, media, and technology. We'll welcome you to share this conversation on Twitter tagging the handle at UNOSAA1, hashtag Africa Dialogue Series, hashtag ADS 2021, hashtag the Africa we want. I'm going to ask our panelists to please mute your devices, but should you feel like tweeting in between conversation, you know, you feel free to do that. What I will do really is going to be a very simple format. Just before I introduce you for the first time, I'll read out your bio and ask you to give me a little bit more on your end. And thereafter, we'll just flow in conversation, if that's all right with you. And without much further ado, I'd like to start with Tsitsi. Zimbabwean screenwriter, director, producer, novelist, and playwright, Sisi Dangarembwa obtained her master's in filmmaking from the German Film and Television Academy in Berlin. She has produced several documentaries and short films and has credits on most of Zimbabwe's feature film classics, including Neria and Everyone's Child, which she co-wrote and directed. Her award-winning short music, Kare Kare Zako, Mother's Day 2005, was screened in the short film competition at the Sundance Film Festival. Titsi lives in Harare, where she founded, wait for it, the, the, sorry, the production house Nyerai Films, the International Images Film Festival for Women, the Zimbabwean Film Industry Development Platform, Zimbabwe's leading professional filmmakers organization, and the African Women Filmmakers Hub, AWFH. She's the founding director of the Institute of Creative Arts for Progress in Africa Trust. She's currently working on a slate of projects, which include the television series Emma's Rhythmics, on a, uh, adaptations of several African novels, and her own passion narratives and the African Women Filmmakers Career Development Project Mangal. I'm almost done. Titsi has been a visiting fellow at the Harvard Dubois Institute, MIT, and Northwestern University. She's presented public lectures at the Nelson Mandela Foundation, the Tabo Begi Foundation, the Mapungu Bwe Institute, and the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Studies. Somebody needs to reward me for the pronunciation here. Yeah, I'm doing my best. <laughs> Where she's currently a fellow. She's spoken at events and festivals in Africa, Europe, and Northern America. Her first novel, Nervous Conditions, was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Prize in 1989. It was it was chosen as one of the 12 best African novels of the 20th century and as one of the BBC books that shaped the world. Her third novel, The Mournable Body, was shortlisted for the 2020 Booker Prize. Sitsi has received art service awards from her home country, including in 2021, the Arts Legends Award. Legendary indeed. What a profile, Sitsi. Welcome. Thank you so very much for your contribution to African culture, arts, and heritage, and thank you very much for joining us today. I'd like to pose my first question to you, Titsi, with such a rich and diverse contribution. What do you see for Africa that drives you to invest in the creative economy so wholeheartedly? 
you're muted. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Modesta. Yes, what I see in Africa is a yearning for a better sense of who we are, what our potential is, and the capacity to realize that potential. Mm -hmm. And I think those three yearnings are bound together. We will not be able to mine our potential and realize it until we have a better sense of our identity, our place in the world as we find it today. And our place in the world as we find it today is bound up with how the world was and where we came from. And this, in fact, is some of the work that I'm doing here at Stellenbosch, where I'm a fellow. Uh, I'm looking particularly at the Bantu migration, so-called Bantu migration, which is the history of how people who speak these related languages, which are called the Bantu group of languages, expanded and migrated through the continent from the area in um, eastern Nigeria, northern Cameroon, up to 5000 BC. You know, so this is a very rich history of people who were migrating, meeting with people, developing as they went, leaving parts of their culture all the way down um, to, to, the, to South Africa, to the Cape. And so I think when we can put ourselves in that kind of historical context, we can do away with all of these narratives that say, oh, you were formed in 1980. And of course, you know, if we're thinking we're only 41 years old, we're a little lost as 41 year olds tend to be. And so I think these are some of the things that we have to contend with. And we have to then find out what this means for the present. How does it enable us to shape our destiny in a manner that leads to thriving lives for all on the continent? And I think that these are the basis of uh, Pan-Africanism, because when we look back to this more ancient history, we will see the connections that people have with each other. It, it is in the interests of those who would wish Africa not to thrive for them to tell us that we were these discrete little tribes that never went down the road to see their neighbors and we didn't know anything, there was no trade, etc. cetera, beforehand. This is, obviously not true and so we simply need to dig for that truth we need to expose it we need to embrace it and we need to build from there thank you so much uh, for for giving us the context of your work and what it is that, that you're looking to achieve um and I, i'd like to build up from that uh, with a follow-up question, but allow me to introduce Dio, uh, and then we can get the, the, the dialogue going um, around what you've just shared with us. Dio, I... I'm going to speak about you in the third person. <laughs> um, over, your, uh, over his career, Dio Ogunyemi has worked as an entrepreneur, investor, music journalist, DJ, producer, entertainment and IP lawyer, and strategy consultant. Now he advises, promotes, and invests in companies in Africa's creative and entrepreneurial scenes, including startups in technology, fashion and apparel, event production, content aggregation, film production and distribution. 234 Media's portfolio includes M Survey, Cinemart, Starflix Cinemas, House of Deola Sago, uh, Pixaplay, Pixaplex, and the African Movie Academy Awards. Prior to 234 Media, Ogunyome founded Letscape, a startup that used, that used AI and expert system technology to change the consumption and practice of law. That's so interesting. He subsequently co-founded Constant Capital, a West African boutique investment bank. Ogunyemi has long been interested in the impact of technology and media on how societies and economies develop, especially in Africa, stemming back to 1991 when he founded NigerNet, the first Nigerian online community as a freshman um, at MIT. I... I'd like to ask you, Dio, um, especially in view of what Sisi just shared about our history, how significant you find that to be? Because um, 
going through your work and I'm so grateful that you're all filmmakers. The quickest way to research filmmakers is to go on YouTube. <laughs> and so <laughs> I was spoiled for choice um, going through your profiles, but I, I, I particularly enjoyed how you mentioned of the dichotomy of the two Africas that exist. I'd like to ask you, how important is it for us to understand the rich heritage of the past that we have and how we can build on that to create the Africa we want through um, the film industry? Thanks, Modesta. And uh, it's, it's always hard being a follow up to Titi because she's still brilliant and has influenced so many people, both through her books and her films. But I think what she said about, you know, putting putting history and African history in context is absolutely critical. Um, when you take that 5000 year view, it you you have a completely different perspective. Um, and, you know, bringing that to the present day, it's interesting that, you know, as mobile technology and other technologies have been used in Africa, the younger generations, certainly compared to 20 years ago, are a lot more you know, there, there's a lot more dialogue happening across um, African borders and um, not and, and across generations as well. Um, but we have to ask some questions around you know, the, the ownership of those platforms and the depth of conversations that are happening. So, you know, in, in a sense, we have, we have a democratization of technology happening, an increase of conversation happening but not necessarily the depth of conversation mm -hmm. that is necessary. Um, Usman Semben moved from, uh, you know, being primarily a novelist to being a filmmaker. And I'm sure Siti can give her own um, account of, um, you know, the reason she has expanded um, her talents from, from writing to filmmaking as well. But it's very clear from a technology standpoint that filmmaking is a, a you know, the visual image um, is a very powerful means of getting ideas across. Um, and I think that we are at a point in, in African history where the combination of platforms and, you know, um, artists and, and um, members of the intelligentsia are such that we can Dive, you know, we can get powerful ideas out to large numbers of people. Um, and, and part of the challenges is going to be um, on the media side, what filters through, you know, are the priorities of the West, as has always been the case, you know, the priorities and, and narratives that are going to, um, you know, feed Africa because of the platforms that they're disseminated on, or are we, a, are we going to be able to carve out conversations and narratives um, across generations within Africa uh, so that, that, that these important ideas that our artists and creatives have really take root among, uh, particularly among the youthful, the youth demographics. Thank you so much, Dio. Um, and what, what a medium to really uh, bring history to life, to bring the the correct narrative of our history uh, to life and bridge that generational um, um, what has been a gap because increasingly so with you know with global influence uh, the youth are drawing further away from that history and the creative economy and the creative industry really um, has a pivotal role to play um, in in anchoring us as uh, as a people uh marie clement welcome well, you're I'm muted <laughs> you're still muted still muted am i okay now you are good welcome yes i'm really sorry i'm really sorry i had to take my son's computer to take part of this event. Um, yes, so, so uh, uh, we are, we, we, I am presently in France, so yeah. that makes my voice extremely strange because I'm talking about Africa and I'm thinking about Africa every day and, and, uh, and uh, this question about how to transmit to younger 
generation, uh, our history, our shared common mm. history mm. is really an issue because we today with the media, we have a lot of noise. Some parts of the world do talk much louder than we do. And uh, the access to those platforms and those media are really an issue today for me as a filmmaker, as a producer. Uh, I don't have the privilege to write. I think it's a, it's a, also something very important. But uh, the, the, the real question is how, how can we reach out these younger generation and bring them this history um, um, that um, has mainly been transmitted by oral knowledge, oral culture, and um, oral culture are very often mis uh, how to say um, um, diminished mm -hmm. by the written civilization. We have that f sentence in French that is. Celui qui n'a rien écrit est censé ne pas avoir existé. Meaning, those who do not write do not exist. Mm. And, and for our cultures, I think this is a real, <laughs> this is a real problem because we, we, we do have to, to bring to them this knowledge and, and uh, how to do it. So, in a way, filmmaking is great because maybe we could bring that oral knowledge to the next generation with another tool that is not so much dominated by the written experience or the written knowledge. I don't know if it's clear because I'm a French speaking and, and you started already, so I'm just like... <laughs> <laughs> what you're sharing is very clear. And I I saw Titi taking notes on that. Would you like to weigh in on the comments that Marie just made, Titi? <laughs> you're muted as well. This is going to be fun. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I absolutely agree with Marie Clemens there yeah. because I think that even our educational syllabuses are not really... Uh, made for Africa to develop African people to be full beings in the 21st century and beyond. Um, I know that in my part of the world, the southern part of Africa, the ideology was just to have the kind of education that would make the local people hewers of wood or drawers of water just to aid and benefit the colonial project. And I don't know whether we have come away from there really sufficiently to create the kind of people we need for a thriving continent and for thriving relationships between nations and between people. So I think that film has a role to play, but it can only have a role within a bigger context where there is a desire to create a different kind of African person. We were created in one way by colonization. I don't think we have really thought about the kind of person that we want to see. In some countries like Zimbabwe, uh, we had good education in the years, a couple of decades after independence, and then education seemed to take a back seat. So one needs to query why those kinds of processes are happening. And to emphasize that film is one part of developing a nation, of uh, engaging people in different ways of being and different ways of thinking and different kinds of visions. But there are other things that need to be happening at the same time. And I see, I see Dyer and I see Marie nodding. I'd like to just probe a little bit on what Cece said. So, um given the fact that you know the theme is cultural identity ownership reshaping mindset you're you you just um presented the fact that okay that's that's one element of it what would you say are the other elements education you just brought that in how would we then approach uh, building this um 
healthy, holistic personhood. I remember uh, watching uh, Tsitsi's video and she, she says, many a times we say our struggles are challenging Africa's leadership. She would say our challenge is personhood, you know, understanding identity, et cetera. What, um, you know, which stakeholders and what roles do you think need to be played so that we can build um, and build cross, cross uh, sectorally and build holistically? We need different history books in the schools. That mm. is the very beginning of it. Because today you see people get the education that they receive. And then that primes them for receiving a kind of narrative. When I made my short film, Kare Kare Shako, that film is based on a folk tale, a Zimbabwean folk tale. So we had the premiere. And like it was at the weekend that we had the premiere on the very Monday, I got a phone call from a young man and he was so shocked. He said, what city? We can put the old stories into film. You know, there is a mindset that doesn't know that this is possible because all our history tells us we began like in the 19th century and all modernity is European. And therefore, we still have to look to Europe. Often the way um, elites in our countries behave is the same. Their children are all going to Europe, consuming European products. And so this is what we expect. So even in our narratives today, people expect the European narratives and the structures of the European narratives to the extent that it can be difficult to interest people in local narratives because they haven't been trained to understand that there's anything of value in our own imagination, in our own cosmological world, and so forth. And so um, it really is a big job, but I think it can be done if we all decide to take these different tracks that we have to work on um, seriously. One cannot just say the filmmakers should do it. That would involve the filmmakers sitting down with the policymakers at very high level. I know there have been attempts at the AU to engage with film, and we haven't really seen the outcomes yet. But there has to be ongoing engagement so we can see what structures need to be put in place across the board. How difficult would it be to just produce one primary school textbook that has a different history of Africa? It wouldn't be that difficult, but we have to get people to want to do it. When we have that textbook, then everybody is open to those narratives of Africa and we can start communicating. Thank you so much. And, and I love how you made that very practical. Start with rewriting history. Have that one history book that has a correct history of Africa, you know, then we can start having other uh, conversations around it. Dio, you've been nodding and uh, agreeing. Um, with, with Sisi's point, I'd like to pose the very same question, you know, to you. W which stakeholders do you see coming together and what roles uh, do they play uh, in really building this, this new narrative, this correct narrative of Africa so that we can then bridge our past uh, with the present and the future that we want? Um. You know, at the risk of boiling the ocean, I think it's everyone. Um, I think educators have to be involved. I think policymakers have to be involved. I think citizens have to be involved. I think, you know, re, 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 re examining what being a citizen means within the African context. Um, you know, when, when, when TC talks about, you know, um, African societies from 5,000 years ago to the modern day and the cross-pollination and, and, and travels and, and um, you know, that, that that entailed over thousands of years. Um, when we look at the colonial, you know, uh, boundaries that define, you know, the 54, 54, 55 countries of Africa today, how does a child in any of those uh, places on the map relate to their sense of personhood. Um, you know, so I, I think Titi is absolutely right that uh, on a practical level, uh, education has to be examined, policymakers have to be involved. Uh, but this is really something that um, 
ha has to happen on multiple fronts. And it's very hard to say that one thing is more important than, than, than the other. Um, you know, what, uh, what, what leaders at uh, national government level, you know, the policies they make, the decisions they take end up being incredibly powerful. But the decisions that happen at a household level are incredibly powerful as well. And again, you know, um, I keep referring back to TC, but, you know, so many of her books um, and, and work have really explored these things in, in, in amazing ways, you know, um, the, the impact, um, uh, you know, on a child uh, of, what, of what access to education provides them, the type of education that provides them, how they evolve um, over their lifetime based on the narratives that they have received. Um, so, you know, for me, there, there are no, you know, there are no easy answers. Uh, we all have to be involved. It has to stem from the smallest household to the highest, you know, supranational levels. Um, and, and I think the, the, the key thing for me is that um, the, you know, at, at every level, the appropriate, the appropriate vision, the appropriate level of integrity, the appropriate understanding of what the end destination needs to be, um, has to be in place. And, and that has to be informed by what the real starting points are. So we have, you know, we have an incredible task, um, you know, uh, ahead to achieve those, um, that state that you have described, but the tools are there, you know, the tools are there. And I, I think the question for, you know, narrowing, narrowing things back to our roles as, as storytellers, as filmmakers, as creatives is, you know, uh, understanding that we are just one part of the picture what are the things that we can do given the popularity and, and accessibility that is afforded by, you know, um, communication technologies? How do we sort of punch above our weight, if I can use that analogy? Marie, you're muted. Automatically. Um, I, I, it's very interesting because I come from um, French colonialism background and mm -hmm. to talk with you is extremely important. Like uh, every time I talk with my friends from Angola and Mozambique where they had Portuguese colonialism. And so the re it's interesting because the relation we have to our cultures, to our local cultures, uh, leave a similar um, uh, this, uh, how to say, uh, how did you say, backseat, like, like the great history from Europe, this is the one you should learn. And yours, oh, you know, it's so complicated. Uh, Africa, in France, they even have recently affirmed that uh, Africa hasn't entered into history. We had a president that said that. L'Afrique n'est pas rentrée dans l'histoire, which is something absolutely um, we cannot hear that <laughs> without doing anything. I mean, um, so the, this this question of which history we should teach to in our schools uh, is absolutely essential. But uh, before that, I feel that uh, education and culture should be at the same level as vaccines and, and food. I mean, <laughs> we are human because we have culture and education. Otherwise, we are just cows. If we only are concerned with food and vaccination, we are just reduced to cattle that we need to breed and and give more and more in quantity, but nobody cares about what they think and so and what they learn and what they at school. It's a, it's a, it's a central for education, but for culture too. I feel very much that uh, after school, kids take a lot of time on their phones on their. TV sets and uh, so the the history should be also infused and diffused in all these 
images and these media because the the way the history is fixed today unfortunately it goes through sometimes through fiction even so uh, uh, in all those very big policies uh, i i really believe that culture in education should be at the center and not the second step uh, in my everyday life as a producer, I always hear, oh, but you know, it's not that important culture. We'll see that later. Now we have pandemia, you know, now we have pandemia. Um, Marie, thank you so much for, for, I mean, you know, when she said this is the same as food and vaccines, this is at the same level, you know, it really brings back uh, the fact that you're not going to have a toss up, you're not going to say this is more important than the other, especially when education so shapes the narrative and the reality, um, um, you know, on the ground. Now, my question is, who takes ownership? This is a question to any of you to, to answer. Yes, multi-stakeholders to be involved, but ultimately who takes ownership? I see, you know, I'm of the opinion that we would still need leadership. It can stand somewhere that everybody runs with their, you know, baton and their piece. Who would you say then is to take ownership? I see filmmakers as instigators many a times, you know, bringing up um, Swahili's coming to me. I can't speak Swahili right now, I have to keep to English, but you know, um, uh, roughing up the ground and then bringing up the dust and discussing things and airing things that, that otherwise have been laying dormant. But then um, who would you say would take ownership uh, such that then it can go, as Dio said, to the family and it's part of the, you know, the family fabric and, and values and, and, and to stakeholders um, you know, in the business environment, in, in, in faith, etc.? Who is the owner of, of shaping the narrative that we want to, to live under? May I answer that with this? Certainly. Thank you. The practitioners have to take ownership and the protect practitioners have to come from a background that enables them to take ownership in an informed manner so that we put out the right narratives because there are many practitioners who put out narratives that are not advantageous to the people. Having said that the practitioners have to take ownership, you cannot take ownership without power because ownership is a claim. Ownership is the right to produce something with a resource. And for that production process, you need power and it's got to be resource. So this is where the filmmaker in taking ownership nevertheless needs to be empowered to do so. This is where we talk about wealthy Africans. Are they investing in film? Who is coming in at this moment in time to invest in filmmaking on the continent? We see that Netflix now has Netflix South Africa and Netflix now has uh, Netflix Nigeria in addition to Netflix Africa, which is wonderful because it's product and it's, it's a free market. But then where are those owned voices that we are talking to now. And if we cannot have policy and an enlightened thinking that makes people realize that the ownership of our own minds and our own stories is in fact the first step to owning everything else that we want, including having thriving cities and thriving nations and happy citizens, uh, we, will, we will not get there because the people who have the power, the resources at the moment, are giving ownership to people who might not be making the same kind of narrative that we are talking about now. And in fact, Dio did wonderful research on this for, I think it was the German government, the Goethe Institute, talking about the need to invest. But I know lots of filmmakers, myself included, who have knocked on the doors of wealthy Africans and a lot of us have been lucky to even receive a response. This, this uh, um, takes me back to Marie's comment on, on the priorities or the perceived priorities. Why would, would, would you, why would people not be so re receptive, do you think, uh, to investing in film, understanding that you're really investing in shaping uh, everything then um, 
that that we're going to build as a continent. Whether that's historically, whether that's uh, culturally, why why do you think uh, we're not prizing it as much as, for instance, Europe seems to, you know, the the, uh, the creative um, economy and and film in particular. I think. No, please go ahead. Yeah, you're on. You're, you're muted. muted. Marie. It's so. It's so interesting because uh, you from Nigeria and I from Madagascar, I think we are absolutely on the opposite on this question. Um, in Nigeria, I, I think there is really um, a, a movement. Uh, I mean, there is a Nigerian cinema. We can like it or not, but there is a motor, an energy of production, and, and that is uh, in, from Nigeria. In the case of Madagascar, what is so interesting, in, probably like in Senegal, is that we see that uh, the French, and let's say not only French, because it's like a, 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 a universal, I'm not sure it's French, but universal company, they have they own a certain number of multiplex of cinema in those countries and it's 100 percent of what is shown is in those cinema are made in hollywood so what what our our gener our children see is hollywood this is cinema our cinema is considered as something for the Goethe Institute or the French Institute, something like very exotic. It's not real cinema. So this relation to our narratives is from the start something important for them. I mean, if they have a monopoly of the narrative in films that are shown in Africa, except Nigeria maybe, uh, it's because it's in their agenda. It's very important for them. This because it's a whole um, conception of the world and 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 uh, uh, the way we look at the priorities. It's very easy to tell that through films because even those who cannot read can understand. So um, it is a priority, for instance, for those. A French company to to invest and monopolize the market of the media in in uh, in Madagascar and say in West Africa. Uh, so uh, our own elites they they are already convinced that this is the way it is. Our cinema is bad. Our cinema do not deserve any attention uh, because that is cinema, and we need to import it. So the relation to uh, the, 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 the culture of filmmaking is from the start very, very damaged with this monopolistic situation. Uh, we, we, we hardly see some uh, uh, African films in Madagascar and, and uh, hardly see any of them. So it is also that not only the making, but the, the distribution and the kind of image we see in our countries is, is also something quite important. Thank you, Marie. Dai, would you agree? Is it, is it a question of perception? And if so, then, you know, what can we do? Well, I, I think the underlying thing that Marie is saying is that the perception is uh, influenced by some of the realities, the political economy of media. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this is absolutely true. It's true for publishing. Um, African, African literature has, you know, um, been largely developed and shaped and, um, you know, by, you know, British and European publishers. Um, the distribution, I, I mean, you know, it's interesting, we're having this very important conversation around arts and culture. And perhaps because we are all filmmakers on this panel, we have necessarily gone into media and business. 
and and very frequently there's you know these things are held to be completely separate things i mean you you can't be more eloquent than tc has been about the importance of arts and culture but i think we've had a very practical conversation as well about the real politic about how media gets financed gets created gets distributed gets promoted and i think marie's points in that are absolutely spot on um it's uh it's great that there is a narrative that nigeria produces its own finances its own distributes its own and there's no question that as the most populous country on the african continent there is a certain critical mass that propels um you know nigerian cinema in in the way um that some of the you know less populous countries might struggle to to do but unfortunately many of the challenges around financing around distribution around which stories get sto- told exist in nigeria as well um and, and 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 i guess again it speaks to the power of you know narrative and story that in spite of that the general perception around nigeria is well they're doing their own thing they're telling their own stories uh but the reality is a little bit more complicated um but i think this all speaks to you know the points that marie and, and tc have made uh in the course of this conversation which is in order to create a new reality we have to envision that reality we have to put that reality forward we have to have an idea of what that looks like and when we have an idea as as creatives as filmmakers of what that is and we put it out in the world you never know where it goes next um i'm struck uh there was a conversation you know a recent conversation about the you know number of booker booker prize shortlist and i know it's a different medium it's novels but uh, you know um it was quite interesting the number of established award winning writers who came out and said you know nervous conditions changed my life nervous conditions is why i write and i think there there's that element of paying it forward and planting a seed where as creatives even when you're just telling a story that's within you that has to come out a story that you have to tell once it goes out into the world it takes on a life of its own and that's what's so critical about creating and that's what to me you know you know these filmmakers deserve you know deserve an award for just you know in in very difficult circumstances in very challenging circumstances continuing to create continuing to put things out saying well no matter no, no matter what the obstacles are around finance no matter what the obstacles are around distribution i will create and i will put it out in the world because um it it believe me it 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 does end up having an impact and if we can just get you know the 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 um institutions and and uh, individuals who have the resources to understand what putting those resources in in service of ideas accomplishes for society for countries for africa if we can just get them to understand that and see the numerous examples i mean from chino achebe you know uh, things fall apart which is so tens of millions of copies and influence you know people all ar- around the world to semben usman's black black girl to you know modern you know across the board nervous conditions this mournable body you know if we understand how these things go out and shape history in telling in telling a you know a version of the world in putting out a version of the world how they end up shaping the world if we understand how important that is then perhaps we 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 will be on the path to creating that africa of the future that we so desperately need to dai thank you um oh, cici i'm actually going to bring this question to you so maybe you can you can make it a double barrel um thank you so much for that i really caught um both the notion that an idea whose time has come you know can really go out and and make a difference regardless of how you think it would be received or or you know how it would be distributed but also i heard you mention um what to me is if you keep doing this there could be 
a time when um, a critical mass of producers of this new narrative um, then shapes policy, shapes our thinking, you know, shapes the way uh, that we process. And I wanted to, to, to bring this question initially to Tsitsi and, and to you, Marie, and Dai as well. Um, the sub-themes for this year's theme are sustainable peace for development, factoring history, and we've spoken on that, harnessing culture and heritage for economic transformation, human capital, culture, and heritage, unleashing the potential. I remember you, I remember, like I was there, you just speaking about um, Creative Africa and what you're, you're looking to build this, uh, this ecosystem, um, this value chain, right, for, for the creative economy. Um, I wonder then, you know, from the question I posed before, could then uh, society, uh, the powers that be uh, economy see the potential in um, in this as an industry, as a lever for sustainable development. Could that then pivot um, the the um, perceptions and even investment um, in the creative economy? Yes, Modesta, I definitely think that there is a pathway we need to take, which will enable us to realize the potential of the creative economy for social benefit. And I'd like to take an example, for example, from sports. In Zimbabwe, sports were frowned upon until very recently. Then it took some exceptional people who were very good footballers, generally it's the footballers who managed to make a career, and one or two were signed to English clubs. This is like two, three decades ago. And people began to pay attention oh, it can work. And then because those people inspired other young people to go against the grain that said you don't do sport for a living, these young people persevered with what was inside them. They were able to learn from sports at school because it was in the curriculum and there were clubs that they could go to to continue afterwards and so they could improve their skills and eventually have somebody with money to invest in them. So I think the process needs to be the same. We need to realize that we need that initial opening up of pathways. And we need to be able to bring this to people's attention. When I read, uh, generally I'm reading off the continent. I'm invited to the West, I'm invited to Australia or wherever but I am not reading on the continent of Africa. I am not sharing on the continent of Africa. This has begun to change, and I'm really happy about that. But for film, it has hardly changed. And one of the problems with the digital age that we are in is that there is so much piracy. So unless people understand that to create that pathway, we are going to have to invest in products of sufficient stature that can actually enable somebody to earn a living. People are not going to be inspired to make those films. Like Dayo said, there are people who just continue to make the films, but when other people look at them, often the reaction is, oh, I don't want to be like that. Because look at how those people are suffering. I know that Nigeria is an exception, but that's only at the top. I know many Nigerian filmmakers who are not in that bracket, who can barely make a living. So we have to open up these pathways. And that goes back to investment, that goes back to policy, that goes back to knowledge. How do you create policy that is going to create an environment in which the creative industries can thrive? And so the conversations have to be ongoing. It is definitely possible. People are working already, but they need more. And then I think there are two other things that we really need. One of the other things that we need is more training. When I look at SADC, South Africa is about the only place where people come for training. I understand that they're setting up a school industry not university academic, but actually industry product oriented. I understand that Botswana is looking at a school now, but basically most people have to come to South Africa. When they have come to South Africa, 
are they going to go back to their home countries? If there is no training in a country, it probably means that there's no industry because the, sc the skills are not required. So there's no point in going back. I know this is the case of Zimbabwe, and so that's another big issue. Then the next thing is what I call collegiality. Some people call it networking, but I think it goes beyond that. You know, we have the institutions like the Royal College of Surgeons or whatever. We need that kind of identity as a group of people who produce this product, which is a service to society. And at the moment, we don't have it. There are no places where we gather and just engage with the industry. There are no places where we can connect in sensible ways with power and with money, which are resources that we need. And so until we can get that whole complex of instances and things that we need working, it is still always going to be in its formative stages. It's always going to be imminent, but never actually happening. If policymakers were listening right now, and we've listed quite a few things, um, and I, you know, scribbling away, and 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 we've got common themes coming through. If policymakers and investors, and whether they be you know African local investors or otherwise, were listening right now, and they said, okay, what would you say is a place to start? Of all, you know, the, the things you've listed, the cross, uh, you know, sectoral um, interventions. What could we start with in 2021? What would so, you recommend? I'll, I'll take a quick shot at this, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so I would say, you know, uh, I, I would say number one that uh, there isn't one place to start, and and the reason I'm saying this is that. Over the last 20 years, I have seen initiative after initiative start and go absolutely nowhere because people think that there's a quick fix to this. Having said that, there are clearly areas of priority that should be pursued. One of those very clearly is access to finance. For emerging filmmakers, for established filmmakers, it is a challenge everywhere, not just in the film industry, across the board in the creative sector. This is a challenge in Africa. Titi has mentioned this. Training is also a challenge. Um, distribution is a challenge. But you, you, what you see about all these things that we, we mention is they all go back to resources. They all go back to access to capital. And I think in this context, it is, you know, there is some hope. Um, there are several um, Pan-African institutions, most notably the um, African Export-Import Bank that has set up a creative industry fund and a film fund, and hopefully... Um, the decision makers there will continue to push with this initiative and will reach out to people within the industry to, you know, understand from folks in the industry what the priority should be. And I'm going to do a quick plug. Um, Titi mentioned it earlier, but I, I'm, I'm saying this because, as I said, it's not a, there's not a 30-second or five-minute solution. Um, the Framing the Shot report, which is uh, one of the first reports of its type that's been done, um, is something that um, I co-authored and you know, really goes into um, some detail in terms of the, you know, what, what, what African film, what the African film industry is, where it is, the challenges it faces and the solutions to those challenges. And I would encourage you know, folks to, you know, again, you know, a lot of times when we look at these things, we say, well, there's nothing out there. Well, there is something out there. There was, there were very few things out there, which is why we did this research in the framing the short report, framing the framing the short report. We've done at least some of the re the necessary research. Certainly more needs to be done, but there is a starting point. And I would recommend, you know, in the solution sections, in the recommendation sections, to take a look at what's in there, because that came from two years of 
having conversations with African filmmakers on the challenges they, they face and trying to figure out what types of solutions they're there. So let's not reinvent the wheel. There's this saying that African history is written in sand. So every time the wind blows or the tide comes in, it's all washed away. Well, we have, we have these things, we have these resources, so let's make use of them. And, and with that, I am sure the, the, you know, Marie and, and Titi have um, you know, important contributions to make in this regard. Marie, welcome. Uh, you're, you're muted. I absolutely do agree on the investment on the long term, meaning in the training, of course, but uh, in the long term, uh, we, we are living in a world where they want immediate return on investment. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in culture, things, sometimes uh, the creative people are ahead of their time and, and it takes two, three, four, ten years, twenty years sometimes to really happen and to reach their audience. So um, this, this idea that culture and filmmaking for me is part of culture. Huh? Um, uh, culture is, has to be at the center of all these policies of development. We cannot just teach, um, how do they say in, uh, in English? Um, um, uh, oh, I have a... A gap, a, a, a word that is missing, um, management. Mm -hmm. All our kids are learning management and mm -hmm. to deal with finances and economics. And when you decided to, to, to learn art or, and then in Africa, generally people say, oh, but are you serious? Do you really mean you are going to learn art and be an artist? You're completely crazy because art is, as it is um, consumed during our, our holidays or at night or after the work, we are not supposed to be working in that. We're supposed to do that on holidays and weekends and at night and do some serious job. Oh. We have that very strongly um, uh, in in our minds of the. So we need to develop this new creative generation that believe that it is central to build new narratives in those new media, especially because now it's it's just overwhelming us. This digital uh, revolution, because I believe that the digital has brought to us uh, filmmakers a really, really big, big revolution in the, in the making and in the, in the, I don't know how to say, it. you make and also you, 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 you take this into your art. You, you have to watch other people's films too. And so we, in Africa, the, the, the challenge is even more difficult than in Europe because we we have a very very hard time on our culture being being diminished. It is what is the link between digital revolution and oral storytelling? It seems very far away, but I think that we we really can bring something new there. I do believe that. Um, some some people can go directly to TikTok without knowing mm. how to read, you know, and to be a very very TikTok is not filmmaking, huh? but I I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I really, I really um, enjoy how you're actually summarizing our, our session, and 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 we're soon, uh, you know, we're soon um, going to wrap this up. In that, you've captured where we started with Titi that there is a history that needs to be rewritten or abolished, and actually have the correct history uh, installed, and then um, to really then. I remember hearing someone say the only way that you can clean a glass of 
dirty water is to keep pouring clean water in it. And so to keep, you know, showing up as filmmakers and, 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 and the different stakeholders of both the creative economy and just our economies at large, um, and, and then building the business case. It seems that, you know, if it, if it doesn't make sense to somebody's bottom line somewhere, whether that be government budget or political agenda or, or um, other uh, sectors that they're investing, um, then it, it's not seen as a priority. Um, as we conclude, I, I'd like to hear your closing remarks on, um, on the fact that, as, as you rightly said, it is it's multi-sectoral Modesta. There is rewriting history and there's a role to, to, to keep um, speaking and, and influencing the narrative and building um, an, an ecosystem where it makes sense to invest. You were saying, you know, as a serious industry and a serious pursuit. Um, I, I'd like to hear from Titsi, Dayo and, and Marie again, um, your closing remarks on how then, I'm going to go back to our theme, um, how then we can really make cultural identity and take ownership and reshape mindsets around um, filmmaking, creating the narrative of the Africa we want. We can take ownership by ensuring that we produce competitive product that people will actually want to see, product that engages the imagination of the population that we are talking to. That means a certain professional industrial level of our products that requires the training that Dio and I have spoken about it requires enough resources to produce a decent product. You know, people think that you can throw $5,000 at a film and have it take the continent by storm. That's not going to happen usually. Even in Nigeria now, the price of making a film that people will actually watch keeps on increasing because we are now competing with all the other films that are being made. So we have to maintain that. How can this be done? We've heard from Dayo that there are people who are engaging with this issue seriously. How much do these people know about the nuts and bolts, the mechanics of filmmaking? I remember that when I was making one of my films, a family member came to see and said to me afterwards, oh my goodness, Sissy, I didn't know that there was so much work. We watch the film and it's over in a few minutes, but just look at the work that you're putting into. That's the industry. That's the black box of the industry, that production process. How much do these people who are sitting in these influential positions know about it? They need to speak to people like you have invited here today, may I say a little shamelessly, because we have an idea of what needs to be done. We have tra track records of actually producing things that people want to watch. And so if they throw money into the wrong places, which they will be encouraged to do by many people who don't want to see African film flourish, because that will be a whole cognitive, imaginative revolution on the continent and imagine what would happen then. So there are many people who don't want that to happen. And they will advise these people, oh, do it this way, do it that way. Um, and they will seek to filter out the authenticity of what we need to do. So those people who are in those positions of influence need to start talking to the people who really know and need to start listening to us if we really want to create this imaginary, social, cultural, personhood revolution that we need. Thank you so much, Siti. Thank you greatly. Dayo? Uh, that was so brilliantly put. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I echo everything that, that, that CC has said. Um, it, it, you know, and, and what I would like to add to that is just, you know, a perspective around um, sort of who is not at the table. And, and I say not at the table um, very clearly, um, you know, there, there are, the, the voices of even even an you know even even an artist and cre creative as accomplished 
as uh, Titi is in multiple mediums, in, 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 in literature, in film, um, doesn't get the type of um, attention and audience that, quite frankly, her work from decades have proven, um, you know, deserve, uh, you know, the, the, the attention um, of, of decision makers. But I also want to talk about who's not present because um, the filmmakers and creatives and people aspiring to be creatives who do not have access to the West, as we all do on this panel. The, um, you know, the, you know, the rural, you know, rural Africa, and, and this has been a theme in, in, in Titi's work. So, you know, um, she's, she's, she's clearly um, highlighted this in many times, but, you know, so much of our filmmaking is skewed towards ideas and stories, um, you know, from, from urban Africa. And, and of course, urban Africa is important, um, but we, we must not, we must also, you know, be, you know, speak, speak for those who are not afforded a voice, even in, in, in um, panels like this. And, and I don't know that there's an, I don't, I don't know what the solution is. I don't know that there's an easy solution, uh, but I think some awareness on our part that inclusivity must clearly, you know, address gender, must address ethnicity, but also needs to speak to um, age in both directions as well as the urban rural divide i'm you know um a film by uh some young egyptian um filmmakers comes to mind um a film called yomadine which was uh, at khan uh, recently in the main competition and was also egypt's uh, submission for the best international Fe feature film oscar but you know one of the things that's an incredible film but one of the things that struck me was this was a film set primarily in rural Egypt with rural Egyptian characters. And, um, you know, it, it just, you know, watching it, it struck me that this is not a perspective that is frequently put out. So that even as we are looking to level the playing field, that we be aware of the privileges that we have and, you know, reach, an, reach, an, uh, uh, reach a hand out to ensure that the voices um, you know, that need to be heard alongside ours are amplified as well. Oh, that's powerful. Thank you so much, Dio. Because isn't, isn't this what we're saying as Africa? Yet there are also these two Africas. And, Absolutely. you know, we need to remember that as well. Marie, your closing remarks. Welcome. You're, you're muted. Of course, I totally agree of, with with all this. I I I do believe too that we need to focus more on uh, a kind of uh, pan-Africanism of cinema, meaning that uh, we need to see and to have our films uh, travel because the problematics are similar. I mean, this division between urban and rural Africa is everywhere. And uh, we as a filmmaker, maybe we have the privilege to be able to touch both, both spaces. Um, uh, I, have, uh, I have decided, because I am a filmmaker, I want to tell stories from this African point of view, you know, as you say, uh, as long as we do not hear the version of the lion, the stories will always glorify the hunter. And so for me, this is the point. We need to hear and to listen to the lions that they are really, really beautiful and so powerful and they have so many things to teach us. Um, and uh, that's how, so on a very small scale, because the access to the West, to all this distribution and the dissemination of our work is difficult. So on our own level, for instance, I will be distributing the Judo Amadis film, which is called Downstream to Kinshasa, that was uh, labeled Cannes last year as a first African and unique African in that, in that session last year. And we will release it on cinema in France. 
but it's it's something like people ask me but why you malagashi what do you have to do with that but this is precisely the point is that i would love to have you know more film from zimbabwe in madagascar and senegalese film everywhere so we need to exchange more and filmmaking and cinema gives us this opportunity because the cinema can bring the world to us very easily too so this is a great opportunity and i really believe that we have the talented we just we have all the talents we need the access we just mm -hmm. need the access Oh, Marie, thank you. And and that just sums up our session so very well, um, because as you know, the Africa Dialogue series uh, promotes the African Union's agenda each year across the different themes. And uh, aspiration, of, um, aspiration 5 of the African Union says, it aims to imbue the African people with a sense of fundamental cultural unity within their diversity, a common destiny with an overarching African identity and Pan-African consciousness, underscoring the main aim of the 2030 agenda, building together a better tomorrow in which no one is left behind. And I've been reflecting on the African um, continental free trade area and, and what that, the launch of that, what that then means for trading amongst you know, the, the, the African countries and what, how much this could influence the, 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 the growth, but also um, the the position and a priority of of the creative economy in Africa when we get to to share not just the culture but also see collectively this as an opportunity uh, for economic and sustainable growth. Um, so I, I'd like to thank you all. I am. I am encouraged. <laughs> I do. I, I do see uh, the challenges, but I'm. But I'm very um, encouraged by the fact that you are. You're going to continue this, regardless of you know <laughs> how things shape out. But as Sitsi said, please do take advantage of the fact that we exist. Uh, Dio said there is a report that's written. There wasn't much done before, but you know, go back to this research. Look at where you can start. Uh, take advantage of you know Marie, Sitsi, Dio, and, and, and the other. Um, you know, filmmakers that have been on the ground, let's leverage what we currently have as resources uh, to come together to build the Africa we want. Um, and so that's the encouragement I take. I do take some of the challenges you pointed out or rather the opportunities in the areas that can be invested in. And I wish you all the very best in, in what you're doing. And I'm going to continue looking out for your works. I want to thank you for participating in, in, in today's event. And I'm going to close by thanking the distinguished guests that have also been with us in the audience. Let's please keep this conversation going on Twitter. Um, and we welcome you to register for the Africa Dialogue Series three-day main event on the 26th to the 28th of May. And you can do that through un.org slash OSAA. With that, thank you very much panelists and audience. It's been wonderful spending this one hour with you. Bye.